Good morning, evening, and afternoon. Uh, welcome everybody to this CHAMP webinar on Import Control Systems 2. My name is Bart-Jan Haasberg. I am based in Amsterdam and I am CHAMP's Events and Engagement Manager. Many thanks for joining in such large numbers. This is a very popular webinar with hundreds of registrations and 60 plus individual airline companies. We are all on a fact-finding mission and the main question is, are you ready for ICS2? Before we move on, a few housekeeping items. Um, the duration of the webinar is 60 minutes. All data is uh, fictitious and uh, the audience uh, today, uh, we organize this for everybody in the supply chain. A recording will be sent to you uh, tomorrow uh, around this time. And uh, you're on mute. If you have any questions, use the tool and we will answer them hopefully during the webinar. If not, then we will get back to you this week via email. And we would be very happy to, to follow up if you have any questions uh, after the webinar. Um, before we start, please let me uh, introduce today's speakers. Uh, from CHAMP, we have Jerome Lorich, Product Manager, Customs and Security, and Louise Leon, Senior Business Support Officer. Along with Christian Piaget, Head Cargo Be Border Management at IATA, and Thomas van Asch, strategic, strategic Project Manager at Air Cargo Belgium. They will discuss uh, compliance with the future ICS2 regulations. Before we move on to our speakers, um, we would like to ask you some questions. So uh, we have now two questions um, and later on the webinar as well, two questions. So let me first ask the first question and that is, have you been preparing for ICS2? So please use the, the poll um, answers uh, and answer the question. Um, the question, have you been preparing for ICS2? Yes, you have. No, you have not yet. Or I will do now after learning more during this webinar. So the votes are getting in. 35%, 38, 41. So it's going very quickly. Thank you for that. We leave it open just a few more minutes. And then uh, we go to the answer. So well, well in the 70s now. So that is a very good ratio. So let's now share the results. And here are the answers. Um, so Louise, as you are the first, first speaker, may I already ask for your feedback on this on these answers? Well, I think this is representative of of kind of what the, the the industry is facing right now, where you've got a lot of people asking a lot of questions and starting to prepare. A lot of people who really don't understand what the new requirements will be and are looking for webinars such as ours to kind of get some more information and then begin their prep. Um, if you're in the no section, then maybe you need to get started at some point because we still have some time ahead. But that's what it's about. Yeah, indeed, one of five almost have not yet prepared. So that's indeed uh, an interesting number. Uh, the second question, um, is ICS2 an upgrade of ICS1? Is ICS2 an upgrade of ICS1? Yes, it's an add-on on the current ICS1 process. No, it will fully replace ICS1, which introduces entirely new business process. Or I have no idea. And frankly, before the webinar, I had no idea. <laughs> is ICS2 an upgrade of ICS1? Yes, it's an add-on. No, it will fully replace ICS1, or I have no idea. And uh, quite a few people are very frank, meaning they have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> So indeed, well in the 70s already in the answer. So thank you for that. Uh, let me share the answers. And uh, Louise, if you indeed could also, uh, yeah, it's very clear, it's very evenly spread. 
It is evenly spread indeed. And so, yes, the answer is that uh, it will fully replace ICS-1. Um, and if people didn't know that, then let's help everyone today by explaining a little bit of how ICS-1 will finish and ICS-2 will introduce new processes. Yeah, so what strikes us now is that two-thirds had no idea or didn't know it. Yeah. So, so one-third has the right answer. So, yeah, there is a, a good need to, to be on a fact-finding mission. That That's clear. Okay, um, let's go to you, uh, Louise. Um, okay. Are you so the the question is so you will you will show us a, an overview high level um, and tell us more about the releases. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bart Jan. And absolutely, now it's time to talk about the new Customs Advanced Cargo Information System. Um, so just as a little bit of a background, the European Union is implementing a new customs pre-arrival security and safety program that's underpinned by a large-scale advanced cargo information system known previously as ICS-1 and now in the new ICS-2. So the ICS-2 is a new IT system that's created to collect data about all goods entering the European Union prior to their arrival. So economic operators will have to declare safety and security data to ICS-2 through the Entry Summary Declaration, also known as the ENS message. The system aims to better protect Europe's single market and its citizens with new customs safety and security measures and will facilitate free flow of trade through improved data-driven custom security processes that are adapted to a global business model. Our focus today will be mainly on airlines who may have more questions concerning the new steps to follow and how Champ is ready to go with our tracks in global customs and security solutions. So as you see in this image, the import control system two, so ICS2, will be operational in three phases. The first phase, as you can see in the image here, started in March of 2021, and each release is different and will affect different economic operators and modes of transport. Economic operators will begin declaring their goods to the ICS2, depending on the type of service that they provide. So moving on to the second phase, which is coming up next year in March of 2023, you will be able to see that it goes from a preloading to a full, Full meaning that you must present both preloading and pre arrival messages to the ICS2 program. And finally, in the last release, which will happen in March of 2024, and this will affect maritime, road, and rail. Again, primarily who is affected right now by this new phase is the air cargo industry, who is bringing in things into in goods into the European Union and who's affected by the new release that's starting on March 2023. In this particular slide, I just kind of wanted to highlight a little bit of the phases and color coding scheme that you can see on the right side of the slide and mention to you that TechSud is the Taxation and Customs Union and PLACI or PLACI, depending where you're coming from, is called the Preloading Advanced Cargo Information System. That is what you will be declaring before actually loading your items into the aircraft. And this said, CHAMP, of course, with our Tax and Global Customs Security Solutions will be ready and we are finalizing the last setup in light of upcoming conformance testing with the customs authorities, and we'll be ready to help you uh, see this through. And with that, I will certainly turn it over to my colleague, Jerome, here. Yes, so Jerome, if you in a minute uh, will go into more in-depth, uh, in the meantime, um, I would also like to ask Thomas van Asch from Air Cargo Belgium, if you have any questions in the meantime, you could also raise them. Uh, you are, uh, as and many of our audience, also on a fact-finding mission. You do this on behalf of Air Cargo Belgium for your members. And there are many, many uh, countries like, like Belgium, uh, Utigat in Turkey or APAT in Portugal, with associations who have the same questions, the same members, and we're all in the same boat. So, um, yeah, if you uh, could pitch in, uh, please, please feel free to do so. Okay, thanks, Bartian. Um, Jerome, please. Yes, thank you, Bartian. Thanks, Luis, and hello, everyone. So, indeed, uh, I will give a bit more detailed information about uh, what's to come. So, as the slide already says, I want to start with some good news first. So, there is still a lot of uncertainty in the industry about the when and what. This right here gives an insight on the when. We can see release one that started March 2021 has reached its final stage next year, March. This is where release two will kick in. The deadline of March 1st, 2023 is the time where the EU member states have to announce full readiness and would need to be able 
to onboard any trade party that intended to start filing. It's really important to understand that this is not the time anyone has to cut over. There is no big bang. Carriers as well as freight forwarders will have a transition period. For the carriers, it will be a minimum of three months. For the forwarders, up to six. We are currently trying to clarify if the six months would also apply for the carriers. And in addition, ICS-1 will coexist aside from ICS-2 throughout 2023 to allow a smooth cut over. I think this is some news which might be a relief for many of us. Sure, maybe immediately a question. Is this information revealed by the Commission in, in on short notice, for example? This is part of the operational guideline document, to which I will refer in the coming slides also. Yes. Perfect. Well, where can you find some information? Uh, in the coming slides, there will be a bit more about uh, what and where to find the most important stuff. First, we can only encourage everyone to register to the Taxud program information and co collaboration space called PIX. PIX is the platform where you can find a lot of information about all the new regulations, but also technical related topics. There is a forum and user groups where you can post questions, but also receive notifications based on answers to questions raised by others. PIX, aside from the CIRC ABC, which is the repository of the full technical message implementation guides and shared trader connection requirements, is the main source for ICS2. So get connected. Um, in relation to the what also, the Taksud, together with representatives from the trade, the IATA, CLECAT, and software providers, has produced the operational guideline document, the one I was just referring to, Thomas. This is the perfect summary of all the requirements and process details. The teams have done a great job to bring a huge amount of documentation and very complex information everyone had to absorb into an easy to understand paper. It covers many things as process samples, recommendations, answers to specific questions, and much more. Everyone, airlines, forwarders, handlers, agents that are being impacted by ICS2 should carefully go through this document in its eternity. Personally, I would almost tend to say it's a must read for next year. The referral guideline is another one of such documents of high importance. Um, created mainly by the same teams. It provides a deep insight into the new referral process to which many won't be used yet. Some of that already need to comply to the US ACAS regulations will have an idea of such referrals. The EU will now introduce similar procedures for preload but also for pre-arrival. It's important to understand. Whereas the guideline mainly focuses on pre-arrival referral management, it can also be taken as a reference for the pre-load processes, which compared to the pre-arrival has to do not load in addition. Inside the guideline, you can find detailed information on how to deal with such referrals and what the many possible different codes mean for you. In our applications, we will have features to properly display and visualize, but also handle such referrals. Some might already have seen such parts of the add-ins using the application for ACAS or NAC reporting in US or the United Arabic Emirates. They were the first two to implement such referrals. Now, the ICS2 process overview. Um, what does it mean? Practically, what all the documents describe broken down to a very high level will <clears throat> mean what we see here. Throughout next year, ICS1, process which is so far mainly consists out of entry summary declaration and an arrival notification will become more complex. Prior loading, the filer has to comply with the new pre-load pre filing requirements to receive at best an assessment complete before loading the goods onto the aircraft. Once you have to go for loading and aircraft has departed, the well-known pre-arrival filing has to take place. The reporting timeframes for this process have not changed and are still four hours before arrival for long-haul flights and at departure for short-haul flights. The one knowing our customs application are aware that our system will perform such filings fully automated and help the carriers to comply with the timelines. After that, the arrival notification must be submitted. It's recommended to provide most accurate information, actual time of arrival at best. So far, the EU was fine with ETA, which can still be taken, but we recommend to provide actual time of arrivals. This is also a known process, which was at least partially introduced under ICS-1. Not all the member states did actually implement the arrival message. 
What is slightly new and important to understand is that after the arrival, you can receive control notifications, which can go down even to the item level. We will make sure that our clients won't miss any of such notifications and will provide a proper graphical interface for such. As a finalization of the ICS2 process, some see it as part of it, others see it more as part of uh, the post-arrival process, the member states will have the need to enforce the temporary storage and the goods presentation procedures. Those are defined under the new UCC rules that are based on the WCO dataset or the famous NXB, many have heard of, I guess. We can see that there is a different speed per member state when it comes to implementation of these new messages. This is mainly something required by the GHAs, but it's still tightly linked to the previous procedures as the MRN numbers need to be exchanged that were gathered throughout the entry summary declaration process. Our applications will help to do that as well. Sharon, do you recommend to do both processes in the same in the same time? I mean, going for ICS2 and then immediately go also for temporary storage and... Um, and the, decision, the decision is partially driven by the member states and how quick they want to enforce these new regulations. We can see that some even intend to introduce the temporary storage or at least the goods presentation prior rolling out ICS2. Others um, will wait for ICS2 and we have received information also that some have asked to uh, push the dates a bit further to not overwhelm the trade with uh, two new procedures to comply with by the means of the UCC and the ICS2. All right. Yeah. So Plucky, preload, what does it mean? Um, we can just again emphasize prepare yourself, no matter of what the technical solution you will pick. The new Plucky program, as a simple fact, introduces new additional process steps to your operations for which you will need manpower and proper internal procedures prepared. It's crucial to make sure to follow the processes as there can be a huge negative impact not doing so. In our application, aside from supporting the pure messaging requirements, we also have ways to support the new procedures offering dashboards, traffic lights, share functionalities, history logs, and documentation features in case of referrals. What is actually the risk analysis that is taking place and the various different status a shipment can have throughout the ICS2 lifecycle? It's mainly what we can see here. For the preload part, we can receive errors, which either mean the provided data was not according to the minimum set of requirements, either by format or completeness, or against the workflow logic, which is so-called lifecycle errors. If all goes well, you will receive an MRN and assessment complete immediately. There are ever chances to receive referrals. That's the stuff everyone is afraid of a bit, which could be a simple amendment request because of low data quality, so easy to solve. It can be a request for information, for which you will need to send uh, newly created uh, messages to provide this additional information, so-called R02 or R03 messages, to the point where extra documentation would be requested by receiving a request for screening or in the worst case, a do not load. The same continues for the pre-arrival part where, uh, except from the do not load, obviously you're already approaching the authority, um, the milestones are pretty much the same. For the arrival, the mentioned controls notification can be received and the well-known <clears throat> rejection or acceptance of the actual message. Well, now going again a bit more into the detail even uh, to discuss the most crucial and challenging uh, changes that will come with ICS2. With next year procedures, it will be allowed for the forwarders to file the house available data by themselves. We could see in rare cases, specific cases, such requests already under ICS-1, but ICS-1 did not support this really. Under ICS-2, in most cases, it will be beneficial for the carrier still to report the house elements just for better visibility, and also a double filing wouldn't be an issue. However, in the cases where a freight forwarder will perform the self-filing and would not share the house available details neither, our application will support such use cases by allowing to flex specific shipments on a master or house available level using specific special handling codes as proposed SFL for self-filing. Just to restate, our application right now mainly focuses on the airlines, GSAs, GSAs, especially for the pre-arrival filing, but we will harmonize the system to comply also with the self-filing procedures that are being implemented. Another new thing, um, 
many have heard of is the airmail reporting. So the preload filing of airmail was already part of ICS2 release 1 and is being done by the postal offices directly. With release 2, now the airmail shipments need to be reported also on the pre-arrival. The airlines have to do that. So the postal airway bill number, including all the receptacles linked to it, must be reported. We will help to comply with that with such requirement by sending the F42 message, which is the technical message name for the airmail shipments, to the shared trader interface. Our system can can be fed with receptacle numbers by manual input, CIMP OCI lines, or CXML messages. And we think about having an upload feature as well. The type of message, and that's important to understand, will mainly be related to the solution you pick to transform carded messages into postal airway builds. There are several providers on the market. DGC, so our custom solution, will not take this part. We built the customs message, not the postal airway builds. That's what we accept, expect as a feed into our system. And the quick comments to the audience, uh, please feel free to uh, to raise any questions you, using the question box uh, in your screen. Thank you, Bajan. Well, the harmonized commodity code and goods description. This is probably one of the points currently making most noise, so to say. And yes, it is what it is. And without providing the harmonized commodity codes under ICS2, the goods movement will be disturbed. There are mainly two challenges to this. First will be to ensure that the harmonized commodity code will be a standard piece of information being exchanged in the trade messages for the future. Right now, I would tend to say that a good 80% of messages we receive currently would not even have at least one code. The, the other part is that the Taksut requests the information on a commodity level. I've put a sample into the slides where we can see that the codes would be required per house arable goods item and not only per house arable, which in this case would be textiles. This, aside from making the first challenge even more difficult, adds a technical hurdle. CIMP messages do not allow transmitting the HCC code on such a low level because of message limitations without any customization. CXML messages would, but they are not the standard for everyone yet. So to support this the best possible, we will offer some tools to also pick HCC codes based on goods descriptions and will um, allow to consume different message types. As a side effect of this, I found it also worth mentioning that there is a new rule that says the goods description for master available must not be consolidation anymore. Unfortunately, there was not a good recommendation of what else to use. So right now we don't have a good proposal of what to tell our clients. The rule is just there. Consolidation for master available won't be allowed anymore. That's a big change. Last but not least. Yes. Last but not least, um, the consignee Ioris. This is uh, also something many might have heard of already. Um, this is not so much a requirement by ICS2, where the consignee Ioris is yet optional, but more related to the new UCC implementation mentioned earlier, so the post-arrival stuff. With those, the handlers might have the need to send the consignee Ioris in the temporary storage messages, and they will, will request such information from the carrier. On the right, we can see a snippet of an already shared request to comply with this in the future. But this is another very challenging piece of information to be exchanged between the trade partners. We have just seen similar thing in Egypt where the asset number will become mandatory soon. A similar piece of information as the EORI in the EU. Now, where are we, where are we going to? Um, ICS2 has many, many challenges um, and we are preparing our applications to the best possible to help our clients, I guess everyone is doing that, to easily comply with that. However, as you might have gotten the idea throughout the past slides, it is not just about the software being used. You and all the parties involved must adapt and prepare. So time-wise and uh, the next steps we are planning currently is to finalize our conformance testing and get the e-delivery accreditation in October. This is mainly about the connection to the shared trader interface and to cover the test cases defined by the tuck suit. There was a delay in this process. It should have started already in July, but the member states announced some delays for that. November to January, we would be looking into integration tests, allowing our clients to uh, get access to the new features and to the new procedures inside the system. If everything works according to the plan, February to May, we would offer some end-to-end -end testing by really doing some production simulation 
and and May June onwards, we would be looking to smoothly cut over anyone uh, everyone into the production environment. That's okay. it. Thank you, Jerome. That was a lot of information, uh, very useful. Um, the, the the thing that I uh, remember the most is uh, the good news: no big bang. Yes. <laughs> so and the and the two systems will will live happily together for a longer period of time, not not so long, but still. Um, so a qu quick question uh, to Thomas. Uh, Jerome mentioned that it's almost mandatory uh, to, to, uh, to, to receive or to look into the referral documents, et cetera. Are you as an association also sending, uh, disseminating uh, this type of information to your, to your yeah. um, community? Yes, absolutely. We do that kind of um, things regularly. Also, the information IATA is um, getting to its uh, to its members. We sh we share that also to our community. The thing, is, and that's um, that's a problem we face here in Brussels, for example. We don't have too many headquarter um, companies based here in Brussels, so um, I don't know if the information is read by by the right people. Um, yeah. So that's a big big thing we are dealing with. Local people are not that much aware of what is um, what is happening right now. But yeah, I can yeah. imagine that that's the same in in all the communities, of course. Yeah. Okay. Then very quickly uh, before we go to the audience with two poll questions, uh, Jerome. I asked the audience to ask questions and they have done that. There are many. Um, there are a few on the postal area bills. So I will, I will raise two. Uh, for PAABB, can we share this information using FWB and FHL to CHAMP? That's one. And the other one, uh, it means mail will be loaded with area bill number and not with CN number. Yes, correct. Um, first of all, well, to answer the first one, CIMP, yes, indeed. Uh, we have defined a specific OCI line um, version, which can be used either inside an FWB to announce all the receptacles linked to the master area bill, or you would be sending us so-called dummy FHLs, because we don't need to ship them consignee details on the house area bill level, but then one OCI line per FHL representing the rep, um, receptacle number. There is this issue of um, character string limitations on house area bill number versus receptacle number, 12 versus 35 characters. That's why uh, the FHL number as such can't be used um, to represent the receptacle. On the other side, we will also allow um, to feed the system with XFZB messages, um, where then the receptacle number can be used as the transport document ID. And the second one, indeed, it's about the postal airway bill, so the master airway bill number, and that will contain the receptacles, so it's not the CN number as such. Okay, perfect. Uh, we will uh, get back to each question uh, individually. So also, if, if it's raised and answered during the call today, uh, we will still answer your question via email. Uh, in the meantime, I have launched the poll question. Um, and this is, um, yeah, you can answer multiple uh, answers here. Uh, there, this is, what is your biggest challenge? Um, data, visibility, procedures, knowledge. And yeah, data, it's, it could be the correctness of data or when do you get the right data and when do you get it? Uh, visibility is, do you know when the shipment is ready uh, and compliance? And how as a ground handler do you know that you're able to build this shipment? Uh, or as an airline, how do you know you can uh, put this shipment on the building list, to, which uh, operations creates and uh, to, to palletize? And then the procedures, uh, how do you do the process uh, from now till the, we go live with the uh, new regulations? And, and the knowledge also, um, also what, what Thomas raised already. It's, um, <laughs> where do you get it? How do you get it? So again, quite a few numbers have, uh, have answered this, uh, this question. So let's share the results. And here they are. Um, yeah, maybe we, we stay with you, uh, uh, Jerome. Um, there well, are, yeah, there... this mainly represents a bit what I, what I would be thinking as well. However, I would have seen the visib visibility maybe also as a, as a bigger part of the challenge um, because quite specifically with the preload filing, 
um, the information has to be shared maybe between a forwarder performing the self-filing, the, air, the airline being aware of the assessment complete status or the referral that the forwarder might have received versus informing the GHA that he at export station, so to say, um, that he can build the pallet. So I, I believe that the visibility will be also a big part of the challenge. Yes, indeed. So let's launch the second question and the last question for this webinar. At what time should I report the preload information? Four hours before departure, at booking time, or before loading the time that it fits best to my operation? At what time should I report the preload information? Four hours before departure, at booking time or before loading the time that it fits, fit best to my operation. And uh, yeah, okay, let's, there, the answers are getting in. We're over 50%. Let's just wait another, another 10, five, five to 10 seconds. Okie dokie, so let's close it and share the results. And Jerome, let's, let's stay with you uh, again for, uh, for this one. Well, number three is actually the correct answer. There is no strict timeline. It must be before loading, but obviously it's best you do it according to your own operations so that you can still react on referrals, but still are not too late uh, to, to block your process if all goes fine. Yeah, so the majority think as at, at booking time, um, which is a pretty 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 quick then yes. uh, it would be good to have it in order by then because yeah. then yeah you don't stand a chance that your call that your cargo will be offloaded or yeah no, not flown but indeed so let's go back to um to the webinar and uh, let's go now to our next speaker so welcome uh, christian piaget um if you could explain a bit more how to get ready uh, with all the regulatory uh, requirements. Sure. Thank you, Bart, and thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak on your webinar. Um, I'm sure most of the people participating are aware uh, of IATA, but, but just remember we are the Association of Airlines. We represent 290 airlines, and uh, I would say that more than half of them are impacted by these new requirements because uh, uh, most of these airlines are flying to or through Europe, so ICS2 is, is a big challenge uh, for our members as well. Um, you see on this uh, cover slide here uh, ICS2, but uh, you also UK Predit, US, US ACAS. So IATA is looking at all these programs that are being developed uh, worldwide. Uh, but again, the EU is a, is a particular challenge considering the number of countries uh, involved, uh, 27 countries, and the number of airlines that are impacted by these requirements. If we move to the next slide, um, I think it was interesting to see um, in the polls that you just showed that I think 59% of people said that procedures are a challenge. So data is a challenge, transmission of data is a challenge, but that's not the only thing. Uh, all the procedures that go around that are a challenge as well. And um, uh, on this slide, I'm trying to take a bit of a step back compared to the technical discussion around ICS2 to just remind what uh, the uh, PLACI or PLACI requirements uh, mean in terms of organization in the airlines. First, there is a requirement to adapt new uh, sets of procedures uh, because you have to manage the fact that uh, uh, your shipment is good to go or not, um, because you may receive a referral or, or not, so you need to make sure that your shipment is, is, uh, is able to fly. Uh, if you get a do not load message, you must act on it immediately. Do not load means uh, that there is a strong, uh, very strong suspicion that there is a huge problem. Uh, the problem being uh, a bomb in the box, to use the, uh, the way the customs refer to that. So basically, a, a bomb inside the shipment. Uh, because the PLACI requirements are focused on security in the first place. So you need to be able to act on that. Uh, that means also you have to set up 24-7 contacts uh, at the airlines and also in the partners uh, of the airlines to make sure that you can handle the, the referrals in time. But there is a requirement as well to upgrade the IT systems. So that's where a CHEM comes in uh, as well, of course, uh, because there is this need to exchange information with customs authorities now, uh, with ICS2 being a totally new thing compared to ICS1, as we have uh, previously uh, heard. And um, there is this requirement as well to ensure that the data is of sufficient quality and, and sufficiently precise. It's uh, uh, 
no longer possible to give a good description, for example. Uh, so that requires a lot of organization as well. And this imposes on airlines to make sure that their partners in the supply chain provide that information in the first place. And finally, there is also the need to support the desk and uh, to have a support desk and uh, and train the staff for all these new requirements. So um, there, there is the EU, but uh, as I mentioned uh, on the first slide, uh, there are all the programs as well. We've heard about US ACAS uh, previously in this webinar as well. The US ACAS is the US system, which is already in place since uh, a bit more than three years in, in terms of uh, implementation and has been tested for several years before that. Uh, so ACAS is the one in place. There is a UICS2 in March 2023, but in parallel to that, we've got other um, programs as well. The UK are looking at developing something similar to, to the EU. Um, the timeline is not known uh, definitely yet, but this is coming up for sure. Uh, Canada as well, uh, end of the year, next year maybe. Um, and the United Arab Emirates are already working on the PLACI uh, program as well. So whatever we develop uh, for UICS2 or for USA Gas uh, in the past will also uh, be relevant for these other uh, PLACI programs. And we know that uh, several other countries are looking into uh, implementing PLACI requirements. So we are trying to get prepared for that. So a lot of challenge for our membership. Uh, and um, if we go to the next slide now, um, uh, that was already alluded to uh, by Jerome, uh, there is a strong need to comply. Uh, you cannot afford not to comply with these plastic requirements because the impact would be huge if there is no compliance. Um, I listed here some of the few um, impacts that uh, we've heard about uh, when we were discussing with the European Commission and the member states. And uh, it's clear that there will be sanctions on carriers that could be financial penalties, um, could go even further. Um, on one of the videos shown by the tax sheet on their website, they even say they could suspend the, uh, op the certificate of operation of the airline if there is repeated uncompliance. So again, something to take very seriously. Uh, of course, that would mean that you really not only don't comply, but don't make any effort to, uh, to correct that in the future. And uh, hopefully that's not what uh, we want to do. Because again, we've got a common interest in complying as well. Uh, we don't want to fly any bomb in, in, in our shipments. Uh, another impact would be uh, the cargo will be stopped at the border uh, when entering the EU uh, if uh, things have not been done properly prior to, uh, to loading the shipment on the non-EU country. So there will be issues at arrival for sure. Um, there will be no customs clearance of the goods, uh, which of course is a problem when you want to deliver these goods further and that impacts the speed, which is the main uh, benefit of uh, using the air mode. Uh, there would be uh, unnecessary interventions as well, um, several refers that could be maybe uh, be avoided if, if things are provided properly in the first place. Uh, and unnecessary interventions means of course uh, un unnecessary costs. And uh, the rejection of poor quality declaration is, is of course, uh, one of the uh, impact as well of uh, lack of compliance. So again, very concrete impact of this EU ICS2 requirements. And that's why we take uh, this uh, topic so seriously. So in terms of impact, um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the uh, detail of this slide, which is quite uh, uh, heavy uh, like this, but basically there are three main uh, topic, I would say. Uh, the first one is uh, there is the new set of data, um, including the six digit for the uh, harmonized system uh, community code uh, that was mentioned already by Jerome. Uh, so that means, uh, as was also mentioned by Jerome, uh, that Cargo Imp uh, will not be um, appropriate. Uh, we need really to move to Cargo XML, which is one of the IADA standards, or systems that are working on the basis of Cargo XML, like the, like the CHAMP uh, systems as well. Um, so that's a big change for all those airlines which are still only using Cargo Imp uh, because this will not be not be any longer possible. Um, then uh, the second uh, big uh, impact is the fact that the freight forwarder can file directly uh, to the customs, but the carrier still remains responsible. So um, that requires every airlines to discuss with their freight forwarders on who will file. Is it the carrier? Is it the freight forwarder? If the freight forwarder files, are we sure that freight forwarder is informing correctly uh, the airline? And uh, each airline may decide a different approach. Some airlines may decide that they don't authorize the freight forwarder to, to self file and that they only fly shipments for which they can do the filing themselves. Others may decide to entrust these to freight forwarders, but then that has consequences if the freight forwarder doesn't provide information correctly. So, so again, uh, not something to be taken lightly uh, in terms of the impact of EUICS2. And the third uh, set of, uh, of impact is the uh, uh, the management of referrals, basically. Um, you cannot fly a shipment with an unresolved referral, or you can still try to resolve it in, in flight if it's uh, just a request for information, but uh, it's at your own risk. And if the referral is not solved when the shipment arrives in Europe, 
then, um, as I said previously, uh, there is impact because this is considered as a non, non not compliant. So this referral situation is, a, is something that is to be uh, managed uh, by the alliance and their partners, and that's also a very important challenge. Christian, maybe a question, if I, if I may. Um, are the airlines um, um, discussing this with their ground handlers? I mean, they are an important actor, I think, um, from the moment the aircraft arrived. Are handling agents being informed by what is required, what is needed? <laughs> we hope so. You know, as Ayala, we don't interfere in the discussion between uh, our members and their commercial partners. We have encouraged our line to talk to uh, freight forwarders and ground handlers as well, indeed, uh, with the hubs uh, in, outside of Europe in particular, uh, because, you know, a lot of airlines will fly shipment from one place to a, to a central hub to then fly the shipments in, in Europe. And we need to make sure that all the people involved in the hub, including the ground handlers there, um, are, are fully informed. So we, we try also to, to communicate uh, through webinars and, and our documentation to emphasize the fact that there is a need of re-talking uh, in the air cargo industry between the supply chain partners, including the ground handlers. But yeah, uh, I cannot tell you how many airlines have actually effectively approached their ground handlers because that's really mm -hmm. up to them to do that. But I think there is a common understanding, uh, at least among IATA members, that it's not only an airline issue, uh, um, this UICS2 situation, and that everybody in the supply chain needs to be informed because a referral can arrive at any time. Uh, even um, we have never a guarantee if you send uh, an information to the authorities and you get a good to go, uh, it's not a guarantee that there might not be a later referral uh, coming on uh, at, at a later stage, even when you're flying, the, the customs may learn of a new situation uh, that requires them to inform the industry. So we need to be all in the supply chain able to manage uh, the, uh, the feedback we get from the authorities in the context of UICS2. Isn't that too dangerous? Um, don't you want to fly only when you're 100% compliant? Otherwise your cargo could, could yeah, be seized even uh, on the receiving side. Again, it's a commercial choice. Um, yeah. the, the cargo keeps moving is, is one of the big uh, things that some of the uh, IATA members uh, wanted to implement. You, you, we mentioned also ICS2 release one, which was for the express carriers. The express carriers, they have other means as well to do their security risk assessment. You know, it's a, yeah. this plastic requirement is an additional layer of security. So if you're confident that your shipment can move and uh, you don't need the customs feedback on that, uh, it's your choice to decide to, to go on, but indeed you're taking a risk, uh, a risk that uh, destination, the customs are not satisfied uh, with the, uh, the risk management that has been done. Okay, thank you. Um, so now if we go into the components of EU ICS2 compliance, uh, so like we just discussed, there is this, uh, this need to discuss between hub and outstations to put a standard operating procedures in place and SOPs are not only managed by airlines but also by the supply chain partners including the ground handlers. There are, there are new business processes to implement as well um, and uh, the update of cargo and mail IT systems uh, and again as it was correctly emphasized by Champ, it's not only cargo, it's also mail. So uh, that's new for airlines to have to report systematically on mail through, uh, through an IT uh, system going to, uh, um, to customs beyond the card. So we've got these conversions going on. Uh, the cargo messaging standards themselves, so we made sure that our own IATA standard messages like cargo XML <coughs> were aligned with the uh, F messages from EU ICS2. Um, we've done a mapping uh, with the support of uh, CHAMP and other IT providers in our industry groups uh, so that there is no lack in using the uh, IATA standards um, that would then help to fill the uh, uh, messages that are required by customs. And then there is a, a need to put uh, ICS2 filing solutions in place uh, and, and that's why also uh, CHAMP is providing one solution uh, among several uh, solutions out there. Um, so. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, because I'm conscious of time, uh, IATA is trying to help as much as, as we can, uh, because again, uh, we really see uh, this as an important milestone uh, in impacting our industry. So we have developed standards, uh, we are advocating the governments, uh, we were in, involved in the uh, drafting of the documents uh, by TechSuit as much as possible. Uh, we are trying to engage with industry. Uh, today is an example, uh, but we have also uh, other events. And uh, there is an event in Geneva on the 1st and 2nd of November, uh, sponsored by CHAMP uh, also, uh, where uh, we will discuss with the regulators about this ICS2 implementation. So the, the DigiTax will be there and also other governments, UK and uh, UAE will, uh, will be present. 
Um, we have some publications as well, uh, recommended practice, uh, and we're evaluating uh, some other potential solutions. And just to, to close um, uh, with the next slide, uh, talking about publications, we have specifically done a PLACI manual, which is not only focused on UICS2, it's also looking at ACAS and, uh, and the other programs. Uh, but here you can find some examples of business processes, recommendations, and uh, that's something we keep updating. We keep updating according to our experience. So uh, I would recommend uh, people to look at this if they're interested in uh, developing standard operating procedures around PASI requirements. Uh, with this, I'm open to any question. Yes, thank you, Christian. Uh, let, let's uh, let's not have questions straight away. I will raise one, and there are many in the in the chat box, by the way. Um, so what what have we learned from the other initiatives that you mentioned or one, one there are a few initiatives also being rolled out but there was one you mentioned uh, is there anything we've learned from how how they did this yeah, so, so the only experience we have uh, about a, a concrete program already in place is the United States uh, ACAS. Um, and in parallel to the EU, we've got the UAE experience as well. So what we like with the UAE and with ACAS is the consultation with industry. And what we enjoyed with ACAS, uh, and which is a bit more challenging with UICS2, is we had a long time for piloting. As we heard today, the time for piloting with uh, UICS2 is much shorter, and that's a challenge. Uh, one thing we've learned as well uh, with ACAS is uh, the complexity of self filing because you're also freight forwarder can file directly to the customs authorities in the US and they don't always inform the airline and that creates a, a big issue for airlines. So um, we really uh, have drawn from that experience to uh, encourage our members to really talk to the freight forwarders uh, for UICS too so that we don't experience the same uh, type of issues. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe the last thing is we haven't seen too many DNLs uh, in the US and uh, so we hope um, we will not see a, a huge number of referrals to manage uh, with the EU, but we're talking about 27 different member states. So, you know, there is no guarantee on how this will be effectively uh, managed in the future. Yeah, okay, understood. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Thomas, now we go to you and, uh, and a few slides on Air Cargo Belgium. And you also have a few questions, which we will raise straight after as well. Yes. Thanks a lot, Bartian. Thanks for the invitation. Just a small word on what Air Cargo Belgium is doing here at Brussels Airport. We are actually the cluster organization at the cargo site of Brussels Airport here in Belgium. We are a neutral entity. That's the most important thing. And we do our projects, which are in uh, the interest of the full community. Um, we have some uh, community projects on sustainability, but we also work a lot on digitization and we put a lot of efforts in, for example, the ECS2, but now also the ICS2 and the, uh, the presentation notification temporary storage project. But like I said, um, there is still a lot of uh, unclarity for us here in Brussels. We don't know how uh, to proceed, I think. But um, like I heard and like I said already before, uh, our colleagues from our surrounding airports are um, are having the same issues. Um, it seems our stakeholders were or are still not yet aware of uh, what is ICS2. Um, and we took the initiative and took the lead in um, sharing information about ICS2. It's really becoming informing, informing, informing. And um, we set up a dedicated ICS2 working group with representatives from airlines, with representatives from ground handling agents and uh, freight forwarders. But in the end, and like I said already also um, before, it's very difficult because we are dealing with local people and not really too much with people on headquarter level. So they don't um, know yet what the company uh, will go for or how they will work. So um, it's quite it's quite difficult at the moment. and. Um, it was already maybe clear uh, previously as well, but here in Belgium, we opted to uh, put the deadline for the presentation notification and temporary storage on the same time um, uh, as the deadline for ICS2, which is even more challenging for us here in, in Belgium. And especially on the second part, the PNTS, um, there is even more um, unclarity. So um, what we as a local community here in Brussels, and it's more for us the receiving side of the of the of the project, what we can do is not really clear yet for us. Um, we are waiting for the airlines on their decision on how to on how to proceed. We are really open for testing. We are really open for um, for changing our procedures, but we don't know actually um, how to how to proceed. So uh, we have regular meetings um, with these representatives in the working group, also with customs, but I have the feeling 
um, that even customs on national levels don't really know um, how how to proceed. Um, it's very difficult for them too. And it's not. I'm not blaming our uh, customs administrations, not at all. But um, it's a European project, ICS2, and I, I I'm not really um, sure our local authority, our national authority here in Belgium, does really know what's the what's the um, next step in the project. So we are gathering information from everywhere on a local level, but also on a national and even on an international level. Um, we are in contact with IATA, like I said already, but also with Kleekat and DG Taxut, uh, with our Belgian Customs Authority. Uh, we really want to have as much information as possible available for our community. So uh, to really push our stakeholders and our uh, clients, our members even, uh, to adapt their processes IT wise but also um, operational wise but that's the main message I have and this slide is summarizing it a bit um, there are still a lot really a lot of uncertainties and we don't have answers yet we don't uh, know what it will uh, bring to us the next the next couple of uh, months weeks and um, like I said and, and that's also what Christian was saying the testing period is really really short um, we we had to export control system it took us for more than one year to really implement it in a smooth way and now we have only six months left to do the ICS2 or at least um, the first of March is very close and then we have some more time that's already good news um, but we really want to um, to be ready and we really want to have um, have done some testing and we fear a bit that uh, time is lacking at the moment so a lot of open questions Bartian. i don't think i will have to read them uh, all um, maybe we can we can take some questions from the from the audience that will be more um, more relevant i think what is the big issue for us on a local level on the receiving on the receiving side a bit on the um, um, the exports um, the import um, sorry it is arriving here in brussels what can we do more what can we do better to really support our local community here in brussels to make sure they are ready for the implementation of its to um, march 23. Uh, thank you thank you thomas yeah what, what you already are doing is uh, you are speaking here uh, on behalf uh, of your community on this webinar and you invited your man uh, your members to join this webinar so that's Absolutely. part of this fact-finding mission. Uh, we have eight minutes left and we have many, many uh, questions. We will not be able to, uh, to answer them all during the webinar, but it's fine. We will get back to you via email. It's true that you uh, in your community are on, uh, looking for answers locally, but this is an import regulation. Uh, we all talk about import, but for the rest of the world, which is the majority of our listeners, this is an export problem. They have export shipments they want to load on their aircrafts. They receive them at the ground handling facilities. They have to be to to to, to they need to be um, yeah, ready to 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 be compliant, etc. So the pragmatic questions are what to do if they are not. Do you need extra warehouse facility? Will aircraft fly empty? I don't think so, but you never know. It's 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 like it's like the millennium bug almost. A lot of uncertainty. So. But let's let's skip that. Let's go to a few questions. Um, the first one that was raised: uh, the freight forwarder can use the FHL message to support the ICS2 requirements. So maybe we can have a short and decisive answer on that. Is the FHL enough? Yes, the FHL is mainly sufficient to be able, for example, to build um, the ENS by the by the means of preload filing which if the airline is sending it would be the F-24 and uh, for the forwarder point of view, I don't exactly recall the message, but the FHL contains uh, almost all information required, uh, apart from some data that's usually being mapped uh, by the service providers when it comes to declarant information, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. But yes, the FHL can be used. Um, what type of message required for, oh no, we already had that, that was the postal we will. Um, what makes uh, ICS2 different from the previous trend? Still today, we report master error bills to customs authorities in Europe, first arrival airport in Europe. Is uh, is there a difference on the house error bill level reporting? 
Well, the difference, first of all, is the introduction of the preload filing requirement, which doesn't, which doesn't exist um, in ICS-1, then uh, allowing the forward or self filing. A lot of difference is inside the, the message content, so to say, um, where there is uh, data mandatory like method of payments, where you would need to create a mapping, things unsure what to be reported. You have to harmonize commodity code that will be mandatory on a goods item level. Um, indeed, you still need to report master, direct, and house airway bill. You need to report the arrival notification, which is similar as an ICS-1, but on top you will have the control notification and then the temporary storage and uh, presentation of goods, which comes on top. So partially seen, of course, um, there is similarities between the two, but ICS-2 will become a lot more complex. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, this question is also coming in a few times. Can you do the pre-arrival filing at the same time as the pre-loading filing combine both pre-loading and pre-arrival? Pre mm. Well, technically it's sending different messages uh, to the shared trader interface. If by the time of pre-loading you would have already all the information available to report also the pre-arrival, then you can do that. Um, but what usually is one of the blocking reasons is that you wouldn't have your manifest ready, which usually is uh, required to have all data available for the pre-arrival filing, things like onload and offload, and obviously also the operation of flight might not be yet secure really, and in the pre-arrival messages you will be asked to submit uh, flight level information like uh, estimated dates and time of departure and things like that, which you might not even have at pre-loading. I mean, no one will forbid to do you you to do so, but um, will you really have the data available to feed the systems or to use your own system uh, if you don't use a service provider uh, to do this? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We we need to move on. Many questions about uh, XML versus IMP. Will will everybody be ready, etc. But we'll answer those uh, individually. Um, so very quickly, Leon, uh, uh, Luis, could you please uh, summarize the webinar? Sure, absolutely. So most importantly, the introduction of the PLACI, PLACI, how you want to call it, which is the preload advanced cargo information uh, that doesn't exist in the in the ICS-1 program is being introduced now. So it's really important that people understand that aspect. Um, we want to let you know that CHAMP is ready with the solution that will meet your declaration needs, coupled with long-standing government relationships that are not only ready to be incorporated with system requirements, but uh, right in the front line there. Uh, we will support airmail through the four processes that Jerome mentioned previously in his slides. Uh, Christian, in, from the IATA perspective, mentioned uh, how ICS2 security aspect is similar to other global initiatives and mentioned a couple of other ones that are also coming on board, uh, which include the similar requirements. Um, Ayat has mentioned what can happen if you don't comply and the importance of being ready, as well as how freight forwarders and air carriers need to work together to cascade the custom referrals. It's really important. Um, Ayata can also help you through publications and recommended practices, as well as their Ayata Plasi manual, which is available by them. And of course, thanks to Thomas, you can see the Air Cargo Belgium is a great example of local supports at this particular airport. Here in this case, it's Brussels. Um, hopefully, we have some other uh, organizations like this that will help people locally to disseminate this information that's important for you to prepare. And hopefully, you, if you have any other questions, you can certainly reach out to Champ or to Ayata, and we'd be happy to take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Um, so I would like to thank everybody. Uh, you can download the uh, presentation pack from the tool, which you can see now in front of you. Uh, tomorrow, you will get a recording. Um, let me also advertise the, uh, the event on the 1st and 2nd of November, uh, organized by IATA in Switzerland. Um, you could visit uh, us there as well. Um, many thanks for, for joining in such lar large numbers. Uh, Christian, a very uh, big thanks to you as well. Um, Louis and, and Thomas, uh, Jerome, big thanks. Um, and we will hope to see everybody on our next webinar. Please stay safe and until next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye. -bye. bye.